Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. It really helps me out. Today, we're going to be talking about the Sterling Cone case. Sterling was only four months old when his life was taken in one of the worst ways I've ever heard. This case is different because I don't think any of us have heard of the way that Sterling passed. It's awful. I was completely shocked when I started looking into this. So let's talk about Sterling. But first, a word from our sponsor. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. NordVPN is a virtual private network which protects you and all your personal information while you are online browsing the web. No matter if you are at home or at a local coffee shop, you could be at risk with an unsecured network. Putting all your personal information at risk, your credit cards, your photos, your address, your browsing history and passwords Words, just to name a few, but basically all the information that would be stored on your device would be at risk. NordVPN creates a barrier so these predators cannot get in. What is amazing about NordVPN is they do not slow down while you are trying to work or browse. So the speed is amazing because of their over 5,200 servers they have across 60 countries. I have it on my laptop and on my cell phone. You can use it on up to six different devices at one time. I worried it was going to be too complicated for me, my non-tech self, to be able to figure out. But honestly, when I was done, I was like, wow, that's it? Super user-friendly and not at all scary as I thought it was going to be. It's an app for your phone and a browser extension for your laptop. One click and you are protected. Right now for my audience, NordVPN is offering an exclusive deal. All you need to do is go to nordvpn.com forward slash Kimberly to get started on protecting your information. And they are also having a birthday extra special deal. So right now is like the perfect time. NordVPN is so confident that you will like their service. They are offering a 30 day money back guarantee. Don't learn the hard way like I did. It's frustrating and time consuming to undo the damage that hackers can do. Another feature is if you don't want to miss your favorite content, even when you're traveling abroad, stay at home virtually. It takes just a click, open the map, click on a location, Location and you'll be connected in seconds. It's that easy. Thanks again to NordVPN for partnering with me today to make today's video possible. Again, it's nordvpn.com forward slash Kimberly to get protected today. Warning, today we're going to be talking about another very crimey child case. If you are sensitive to said topic, I'll see you in my next one. Sterling Cohn was born in Mount Pleasant, Iowa on May 1st, 2017 to his parents, Cheyenne Harris and Zachary Cohn. Sterling had an interesting start to life. Cheyenne and Zach decided to go to a party as one does at nine months pregnant. Cheyenne thought she needed to use the bathroom. Many trips to the bathroom and laxatives, she wasn't getting relief. On her final trip to the bathroom, she finally discovered she was actually in labor. Sterling was coming. Cheyenne freaks out and calls Zach into the bathroom to help her. Sterling's head was already peeking out at this time. Zach tells Cheyenne to get in the bathtub so that they could do a water birth. Zach said that he's seen it before, he'd never done it before, is why he suggested it. It's a bit odd that Cheyenne didn't realize her symptoms as she had given birth before, but we will continue. She gave birth in the bathtub of her friend's house at a party. An ambulance was called to the house and both her and Sterling were taken to the hospital. Little Sterling was kept in the hospital for several days for observation because of the concern about his lungs. The doctors thought that maybe he had water or feces in his lungs 
from the birth in the bathtub. Cheyenne was kept for a couple days due to so much blood loss. When Cheyenne described his birth in her interview, she had no emotion other than being irritated that she couldn't go to the bathroom all day. Sterling had meth, which I will refer to as substances going forward, in his system. But nothing was done about it. No one at the hospital called CPS no one spoke up and said, hey, this baby has drugs in him. No one said anything. Why even test for it if you're not going to do anything with the information? She gave birth in the bathtub at a party, so many red flags were ignored that the hospital could have acted upon. Zachary Harris, the dad, was raised in a Mennonite community, which is known for men working and women staying home, who cooks and takes care of the children. This is how Cheyenne and Zach set up their life, their relationship. Growing up, Zach wasn't the easiest kid. He was kicked out at 16 for smoking and drinking. He admits he started using substance at 17 when he started a job as a truck driver and used it to stay awake for long hours. Zach was married before and had a son, but the son lived with Zach's parents and Zach had no contact at all with his son. There is nothing really out there as to why he didn't have contact with his son, but it could be the fact that he was always on drugs. So after Zach gets divorced, he met Cheyenne. Zach was 25 at the time and Cheyenne was 17 years old. About a year after they met, Cheyenne gave birth to their first daughter named Nala. Nala was very well cared for by her parents and grandparents. They were living in Louisiana at the time. Zach said in his testimony that Cheyenne wanted to move to Iowa where she could be close to her family. So they they moved to Riceville, Iowa for a short time. Zach would go through spouts of sobriety, but time and time again, he would succumb to his addiction. Zach started using substances again and now introducing it to Cheyenne. The couple were using it every day. In the summer of 2016, Cheyenne got pregnant with Sterling. This would have been a great time for them to give another go at sobriety. Unfortunately, they did not. Zach would say that Cheyenne was not easy to deal with if she didn't have it, so he just supplied it to her. A happy wife, a happy life. Gross. After Sterling was born, he stayed in the hospital for a week and then was considered healthy healthy enough to go home and he, and he went home with both Cheyenne and Zach. They moved to Elta Vista, Iowa for a new job Zach had gotten. Elta Vista has a population of like 227 people. I believe you blink and you'll pass the whole town. But anyways, Zach's job was to haul chickens from one place to another. So he was always on the road as a truck driver. He was still using substances that he would get from a friend at work so he could stay awake on the road. Think about that the next time you're driving next to a huge semi scary, honestly. Zach would say that he was on the substances to stay awake. Addicts look for reasons to do what they want to do. This wasn't part of Zach's job requirements to make you stay awake for days. Alta Vista was a small town with a close community that was very welcoming. Cheyenne and Nala, the older child, were outside playing on one day and Cheyenne met her neighbor, Jennifer Shriver. Jennifer seemed to be a very kind person and noticed Cheyenne seemed to be struggling, so she offered to babysit the kids. Jennifer, the neighbor, watched the the children on two different occasions. When she watched the kids, Cheyenne would go on the road with Zach in the truck. The neighbor watched both Nala and Sterling for 17 hours each time. She didn't mind the long hours. The neighbor loved having the two children at her home. She said both were well fed and taken care of. When they were dropped off, Cheyenne gave her a notebook with instructions on how to care for the children. The neighbor 
neighbor would say that she noticed that Sterling was a little underweight. Other than that, he seemed healthy. When the neighbor mentioned it to Cheyenne, she said that Sterling had issues with regular formula, so he had to switch him to another one in hopes that that will solve the problem. The neighbor felt solace for those couple of days she had Sterling. Sterling was fed and shown love. Sterling's sister, Nala, she was 21 months at the time. Unlike Sterling, she seemed to be well-nourished, healthy, and happy. She had both of her parents to take care of her. Cheyenne was admittedly a very young mother when she gave birth to Nala. She was only 17 years old, but she did have a clear mind and her family's assistance. When Sterling came two years later, Cheyenne was in a much different position. She was using substances also known as ice daily, even while pregnant. She was also left alone in the apartment she and Zach rented in Alta Vista as his job required him to be away most nights. Cheyenne would love to make you believe she was a victim. I was left alone, boo-hoo. She had a neighbor who offered to take care of the kids. She had her mom close by. She just was too busy getting high to care. On August 29, 2017, Zach Cohn said he went to work around 5 p.m. and got home around 3.34 a.m. on August 30th. When he got home, he fed Nala because she was hungry. He didn't see Sterling before he left because Cheyenne said Sterling was sleeping. And when he got home, it was the same story. He didn't hear him crying, so he didn't go and look. At around 11.30 a.m., Zach was woken up by a hysterical Cheyenne stating that Sterling had died. According to the 911 call that Zach made at noon on August 30th, he said that Cheyenne checked on the baby at 9 a.m. and he was fine, but at 11.30, he was gone. Not not dead, not deceased, not, not breathing. He was gone. He was very calm. Here is the call. Okay, what's going on? Uh, around nine, my girlfriend went to uh, feed our son, and then uh, about 11 or, or 11.30, she went to check on him, and he was gone. Gone, meaning? He died. He finally said he died. He really could have led with that, but anyway. He suggested that the baby died of SIDS in, in that sudden infant death syndrome. This was not the case for poor Sterling. This was so far off the mark, it's almost shocking that he suggested it. When the first responder, Tony Frederick, testified in court, you can tell she was deeply affected by Sterling's case. It had been two years and she was still struggling to talk about it. Being the first responder, she was called to the scene. She was told there was a baby in distress. Here is what she said happened after she arrived. She saw a man and a woman and a little girl. She ran up to them. They were outside. Where's the baby? She was rushing as a first responder to save a child. She said there was no emotion in Zach or Cheyenne. Zach just said, inside. She insisted that he show her, so they went inside to the back bedroom, and still the first responder was looking around, and there was no crib, no pack and play, nothing. I know she was thinking, where's the freaking baby, you monsters? On the left side of the room, there was two mattresses leaning against the wall, and there was a baby bouncer as well. There was a large dark blanket covering the window, so it was very dark in there. This is where they led her, but she still couldn't see the baby. She said it was dark, it was hot, and it was stuffy. It stunk of urine. Finally, Zach said that the baby's in the swing. The first responder says, you need to turn on a light in here. When the lights were finally turned on, she saw the swing, which was facing the wall. Here's the picture of how the swing is facing. So if you were to peek in the room, you would see the back of the swing. No sterling. The first responder went to the swing thinking she was going to save him. She said his eyes were fixed and dilated. He had blood around his mouth. She touched his hands and his feet 
and they were cold and stiff. His little hands were clenched into fists. This 30-year veteran first responder was severely affected by being involved in this case. So many people were affected by Sterling's death. Because there was nothing for Tony or any of the first responders that came that day could do for the baby, for Sterling, he was transferred to the medical examiner still in the swing. Detective Reed Paolo testified that they took the swing apart, left him in it so that the medical examiner could see how he died. They then sat up the swing at the medical examiner's office with Sterling in it. Here is the awfulness they would discuss. Sterling, at only four months old, weighing less than seven pounds, had maggots in various stages of development on his clothing, on his skin, in his diaper. The medical examiner found Sterling died of dehydration, malnourishment, and E. coli. The manner of death was homicide. For approximately nine plus days, Sterling had not had a diaper change, a bath. He had not been picked up, much less any kind of affection. He stayed in that powered swing for days in days. The urine and feces in his diaper eventually started to eat away at Sterling's bottom, back, and legs. The skin on his bottom had came off and he got an E. coli infection from the feces. Sterling just needed a clean diaper. That's all. Sometimes his monster, sorry, mother, would come in and prop a bottle up for him. That's his much affection as Sterling would get. And weighing less than seven pounds, it wasn't very often. The hot room he was in attracted flies, which laid eggs that hatched into maggots while Sterling was alive. They crawled in his clothes and his diaper for days. A forensic entomologist, Timothy Harrington, who examined the insects on Sterling's body, concluded that the baby had been in his swing for nine to 14 days in the same diaper. He said the baby had so much urine, feces, and extreme diaper rash, it attracted flies to his body. He said this baby would have cried constantly because he was hungry, thirsty and needed a change. Hence the swing facing the wall to muffle the crying sound, in my opinion. He also said that Sterling had been dead for at least a half a day to a full day before it was reported. So when Cheyenne said she checked on him at 9 a.m., he would have already been deceased if that was true. The autopsy photographs appeared to show that the baby was wearing camouflage pants, a shirt with a cartoon cow above the words, let's play. Even his clothes were was pointing out basic needs. Cheyenne cried in court after prosecutors showed the jury crime scene photos. At the beginning of the trial, the defense attorney, Hawbaker, representing Cheyenne, said while Sterling's death is a tragedy, it was not a planned murder. She suffered from postpartum depression and self-medicated, but she had no desire to harm her child. She had taken care of a baby before because she had Nala and she was proof that Cheyenne knew how to care for a baby. Drugs or not, there had to be moments when she wasn't high. Maybe when she woke up in the morning. I mean, we are talking 9 to 14 days that she didn't have one single lucid moment. One moment where she had a clear head. She could have saved Sterling. Just a single diaper change. She didn't care. The baby laid in that swing, in that room, facing the wall alone. It's heartbreaking. What's bizarre is she took care of Nala during these 9 to 14 days. Nala was fed. Nala was bathed. So why? Why was it different for Sterling? I get it. Zach was on the road sometimes, but he was home daily. When asked, he stated it seemed when he was home, the baby was sleeping. You didn't even go in to look at the baby? Your baby that was dying? 
gang of malnutrition, dehydration, and a frickin' diaper rash? In Zach's trial, he took the stand and essentially blamed everything on Cheyenne. He said that he couldn't change poopy diapers because he would throw up. And this was well known by Cheyenne. It was almost an agreement between the two of them. He stated he did not know that the baby was left in the swing for 9 to 14 days with no help. He said he relied on the wrong person. He said he expected Cheyenne to tell him if she needed help. In Cheyenne's trial, they played the audio interview with Detective Chris Calloway. She said Nala woke up just before noon on August 30th, 2017. She got up and changed her diaper, went to the bathroom, got Nala set up with a movie and breakfast, which was cookies. When she said to the detective that she had given her cookies, there was almost shame in her voice, which is interesting that that's what she chooses to have shame over cookies. Then she thought it had been a while since she'd heard from Sterling. So she went into the room, found him dead in his swing, and woke up Zach and told him. I think it's safe to say that Sterling was an afterthought. The parents had separate trials which presented the same facts essentially. In Cheyenne's trial, the defense tried to say that Cheyenne may have some postpartum depression and she was heavily using drugs and this is why she, they wanted to part off from Zach different defense strategies. The prosecutor debated that even if Cheyenne was using drugs, she was still able to take care of the other child, Nala. In Cheyenne's recorded interview that day, Sterling died and wasn't sure when she last saw him. It was probably 9 a.m., but maybe 9 a.m. the previous day. Chris Calloway said when speaking about Sterling, Cheyenne was detached, but when she talked about Nala or the dog Leo, she would just light up. So she was saying she left her four-month-old alone, no bottle or change, for what, 26 hours? Possibly? Well, we know it was longer than that, but anyways. She says she finally went to check on him after she took care of Nala, like I mentioned. She said that she saw Sterling had passed. She left him there. She didn't pick him up. She didn't try to save him. Even a child that's a complete stranger, you would naturally want to pick them up, pat them on the back, do something, not just stare at them. Neither Zach nor Cheyenne picked Sterling up out of that death trap. Did the couple rush and call 911 immediately? No. First, they took out the trash. Zach walks over and asks the neighbor to keep their dog for a bit because they weren't allowed to have dogs in the apartment they were living. Living. Then after all that, I guess he forgot to update his Instagram post because that's the only damn thing he didn't do. And then he finally calls 911. During Cheyenne's trial, a man named Jordan Clark testified. Jordan Clark lives with his parents and he used to haul live chickens with Zach. He saw Zach every day at work, five days a week. They would talk often. They would do substances together while waiting for their trucks to be loaded. This man also said he came to their apartment on several occasions, multiple occasions. He knew that there was a daughter. He had no idea there was a baby in the house. Zach never mentioned to him he had a new baby. They would go into the master bedroom where he, Cheyenne, and Zach would get high away from Nala. Nala would stay in the living room watching a movie. Jordan said he was there on several occasions and had no idea there was a baby in the house. He testified that Cheyenne took care of Nala. He saw her prepare food for her and would give attention to Nala. He said Nala was clean and properly clothed. He said he learned for the first time of Sterling's existence when Zach called in to work after Sterling died. After Sterling died, Jordan states he began a relationship with Cheyenne. Jordan, self-evaluate your choices in women for God's sake. He said it started with a test text in mid-September. He states he and Cheyenne met up a couple times for a little bump and grind. Cheyenne is still living with Zach. Zach didn't know at first, but he would find out. I just want to point out, this is mid-September. Her baby died August 30th. She spent, what, 
two weeks grieving the loss of her child. In my opinion, she didn't grieve for five minutes for Sterling. But you guys leave your thoughts below. Oh yeah, and remember she's claiming she has postpartum? Well, I guess her postpartum had passed as well because now she wants to get her freak on again. Zach found out about the affair, but still stayed together. I mean, after all, they were soulless mates. But she also continued seeing Jordan. Her and Jordan continued their relationship even up to the day she started her trial. They text each other daily saying they wanted to be together. They love each other. They would send explicit messages to one another. Although there was no evidence to state that Cheyenne had cheated in the past, this is just my opinion, I wonder if this wasn't a new thing. Why I say this is because there was some questions on whether or not not Zach was the father of Sterling. Zach would say he had people say to him he seemed, Sterling seemed to be a little bit too light complected to be his. During his trial, he was questioned about this, whether Zach felt like he was his or not. He would say it didn't matter either way, he would still claim him. His actions state otherwise. He was not interested in Sterling, didn't believe he was his kid, so he ignored him, and Cheyenne soon followed suit, in my opinion. Cheyenne's mother, Brandy Harris, also testified under subpoena from the prosecution. She didn't want to testify. The cameras were not allowed to film her because Zach's trial, she testified, and she started getting death threats, threats that were being taken very serious by the the police, so she was filmed audio only. They focused the camera on Cheyenne, and we got the first glimpse of her emotions. As her mother testifies, you can see true shame in Cheyenne. She cries while watching her mom. At other times, she smiles when her mom says something quirky. Other than this, Cheyenne seemed to be absolutely dead inside. In Zach's trial, they pointed out that Zach, Cheyenne, and Nala, and even the family dog, Leo, were all fed and cared for. So why was Sterling all alone starving in the back bedroom? Zach said he put his trust in the wrong person. He was constantly blaming Cheyenne. Sorry, Zach, but you're the dad. It was your responsibility too. The prosecution pointed out that before Zach called 911, he took the dog to the neighbor. So he took care of his dog first. Time after time, he blamed Cheyenne. He took no responsibility for his part in the death of Sterling. Well, other than he trusted the wrong person. You mean your cheating drug addicted girlfriend? You did put your trust in the wrong person. But when you haven't seen your child in maybe two weeks, did you ever wonder if he was okay? There is no evidence of that. Also in both trials, they were subpoenaed against each other, trying to get the other to testify against them. When Cheyenne was subpoenaed by Zach's counsel, she pled the Fifth Amendment, and Zach also pled the Fifth when Cheyenne's counsel subpoenaed him. Neither was willing to testify for one another, and that tells you a lot about them. It took the jury four hours to find Cheyenne guilty of first-degree murder and child endangerment. She was sent sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. The jury took less than an hour to find Zach guilty of first degree murder and child endangerment. He was also sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Both Zach and Cheyenne have filed appeals that have been denied. Cheyenne is now housed at the Iowa Correction Institution for Women. Recently, a documentary filmmaker visited the prison as part of a series she's been doing called Locked Up with Lifers. She has been to many prisons while doing this series to get an inside look at what life is like after someone gets sentenced to life without parole. Overall, her series has been met with praise and she has filmed many 
many episodes with no issues. Until Cheyenne. While filming one of her shows, she meets inmate Cheyenne. At the time, Cheyenne was in segregation for getting into a fight. She claimed that she had been bullied, so the filmmaker interviewed her and some of the other inmates. She asked Cheyenne if she killed her son. She says no. She really doesn't think she's guilty. No responsibility whatsoever. She says, if I hadn't been high on drugs, it wouldn't have happened. She says that on drugs, she was a bad mom. After the documentary aired, many viewers were curious about Cheyenne's story. Not much of her actual crime is on film. So they Googled and were horrified, just horrified horrified. Probably as you have been listening to this story, they had never heard of a baby dying in that way. Because of the outrage about Cheyenne's crime, the video keeps getting pulled. But this little I saw, Cheyenne is so not likable at all. She is smug. She is cocky. She doesn't take any responsibility. I really wanted to feel sorry for her, but that that lasted five seconds before I hoped her cell was filled with dirty diapers. I am an imperfect person. What can I say? Thanks for listening to Sterling's story. And thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. Their link will be in the description box. Thanks to all my channel members who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and decide the cases that I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button from a desktop or there is a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you guys have made it to the end you guys are rock stars and I love you to death there are more true crime videos in my crimey stories playlist for you to check out stay safe my loves and remember if you see something say something and I'll see you in my next one bye